this week's video, we're going to look at the works of six American architects and one act of legislation that undeniably changed the landscape of American architecture. But before we get into these architects, I'm going to share with you a journey and story back when I was an architectural apprentice and I designed this kitchen. The pre-existing kitchen wasn't anything to write home about, but hey, it's still cooked. My bosses went and met with the clients and they came up with this sketch. If you're familiar with architectural sketches, this may make sense to you. If not, this is what it looks like after I converted it into CAD drawings. Now keep in mind, I'm familiar with drafting by hand and by AutoCAD, but all of the works that you're gonna see in this building presumably were done by hand, everything. They didn't have computers to design and come up with all of the documents quickly and efficiently, like I did. Here you can see the demolition plans. Here you can see the floor plan, the elevation, the electrical plan, and the window schedules. Also structural details with the help of a structural engineer. Even though this is just a kitchen, there are a lot of moving parts. And once we get those down, then we can come up with the models and make it come to life. And finally, after that, the builders can get to work with their abundance of power tools and access to Home Depot, which I can safely assume the builders of all of the buildings that you will see did not have access to. And when he's finished, we get a nice end result that everybody's proud of. To be honest, I couldn't believe that I designed this. But what if I told you that a 21 year old designed this building just before the Civil War and it was built just after the Civil War? Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Geomancy, looking at the past to see ahead. We're going to be looking at architectural history today, particularly in America, and learn about some architects that were said to have done a lot. Previously, we did an architectural analysis where we looked at a couple different features that can be seen in buildings all over the world. We found some examples and even some familiar faces. This week, we're going to do an American architectural history lesson. And we're going to learn about six or seven architects and one act of legislation that changed the landscape of American architecture. All of these men that I'm going to show you were born in the late 1800s and lived into the early 1900s, mid 1900s, and had a profound impact on everything that we see coast to coast. So, the first architect we're going to look at is Horace Trumbauer, although I've read some conflicting information that he may not have even been an architect, he was just a businessman who had a team of architects that he uh, managed. He did many works all over the country, especially on the East Coast, and at the young old age of 25 years old, he somehow designed this castle. So one of the things that you're gonna find with these architects is that many of them did fantastic things at a very early age with minimal training. Um, some of them did have a lot of training, extensive training, but he essentially became an apprentice at 16 and worked at a couple firms and then created this. And then at the age of 31 or so, he created this mansion, Linwood Hall. His most prominent architect in his firm was a man, Julian Abel. Julian Abel was a young black architect who designed many notable buildings in Philadelphia and around the country. However, he didn't claim credit for many of them except the Duke University Chapel, which I showed in my last video. So, um, 
I'm going to show just a couple of his buildings at once and then at the end of this video, depending on how long it goes, I'll show more buildings of these architects. But I'm not gonna read the bio because it's gonna take too long. I will link all of this below as well as some additional resources for anyone who wants to check out. But he was born to a prominent Philadelphia family um, which is interesting to note and there are some connections to other people that I have mentioned in other videos so here are some of his buildings the Duke University Chapel they built that right during the Great Depression Widener Memorial Library in Harvard built right after World War two sorry World War one Parkway Central Library in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, although there are many architects attributed to this building. And he also was responsible for doing some of these robber baron mansions and estates that Horace Trumbauer's firm uh, claimed credit for, including Ballingary and Ronald Manor, and many others. I don't think that these buildings many of them were fully designed and built from the ground up at the time they were said i think they were more so renovated and rehabbed similar to how i did next architect is george a frederick a german-american architect from baltimore who designed that baltimore city hall that i showed in the intro pretty fantastic for a 21 year old to design just before the civil war and then shortly after the Civil War, it was built and constructed. I mean, that's fantastical. But here are some of his buildings that he did in the Baltimore area. You've got the Baltimore City Hall, again, right after the Civil War, 1867 to 1875. We've got Kilburn, 1873 to 1889. The German Orphan Asylum, 1873. St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church, right when the Civil War ended, 1864. St. James the Less Church, 1865. The Moorish Tower in 1870, and the Moorish Bandstand, 1865. Interesting uh, connection with him is his name, George A. Frederick, and he's German. Well, that also happens to be the same name as King George IV, George Augustus Frederick. King of Great Britain, Ireland, and King of Hanover. However, you see his depiction here. I've covered this coin a couple times in the past. That is a different depiction of King George IV. I'm not gonna tell you what to believe or to believe anything, to be honest. Next up, Henry Hobson Richardson. This man's buildings are visually are some of the, what we would say, very old world. Uh, he's, he coined a style called Richardsonian Romanesque. His bio is pretty interesting, just like the others. Born in Louisiana, uh, went to Harvard and Tulane. Then he went to Paris right before the Civil War to attend the Ecole des Beaux Arts, which is the world renowned arts, architecture, and design school of the world at the time. It's, it's a reset institution. So he came back. And then he started cranking out buildings like this. His first building in the Richardsonian Romanesque style is the New York State Asylum, seen right there, done in 1870. But the rest are still pretty spectacular. Trinity Church, Boston, Cheney Building in Hartford, Connecticut, Grand Sarge Junior House in Albany, right next to some stepped gables. We've got the Oaks Ames Memorial Hall, the Ames Monument in Albany County, and the New York State Capitol in Albany, New York. Some connections with Ames and Albany for sure. But Ames, he was responsible for funding the Transcontinental Railroad or something along those lines. Interesting story. Next up is Cope and Stewartson, a duo also a Philadelphia firm. Again, Philly is the old world, I've been saying that. So the Philly architects that are coming out of this time period, I believe are learning and, and renovating these buildings and figuring out 
how to do it. So founded by Walter Cope and John Stewartson, they did a lot of collegiate Gothic buildings all over, including Blair Hall, which I've shown in uh, America is the Old World Part Two at Princeton. But let's look at some of their buildings because again, they're spectacular. The quadrangle dormitories at Penn in Philadelphia, done in 1895. Bryn Mawr College, Radnor Hall in 1887. I wonder how long it takes for ivy to grow. Um, Blair Hall at Princeton, which I showed almost from that angle, 1896, looking very similar to Brookings Hall at Washington University in St. Louis. And this building was the administrative headquarters for the World's Fair in St. Louis. Seems like it had many purposes. I wonder if there was a train leading up to it, just like at the one in Princeton. The Alfred C. Harrison building in Philadelphia, 1894 to 1895. John A. Wilson building, Washington, DC, 1904, 1905. University of Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, 1895. Next up, Cass Gilbert. So the next two architects are very closely um, related, not by blood, but by work, and you'll see why. Cass Gilbert was an early proponent of skyscrapers, and he's from Zanesville, Ohio. Essentially, he became a very prominent architect doing federal buildings, government buildings, and he said that his public buildings reflect the optimistic American sense that the nation was heir to Greek democracy, Roman law, and Renaissance humanism. Hmm. I mean, we could say that about the old world. But anyway, let's look at some of his buildings. Minnesota State Capitol, there they are putting the dome on just as we would expect. We can't see any other construction photos of that one. Well, to be honest, I haven't looked deeply. 1896 to 1905, um, we've got the US Supreme Court, 1932 to 1935. Again, during the Great Depression, we seem to have money and resources available to erect these buildings. The Alexander Hamilton US Custom House in New York City, which was won in a competition, which I'll get into later. The Woolworth Building in New York City, 1910 to 1913. I mean, that's quite a skyscraper. And then he did a handful of state capitals, which all seem to follow the same template. Minnesota, Arkansas, and West Virginia. And it's interesting that they felt the need to give West Virginia a golden dome. Again, this was being completed during the great beginning of the Great Depression, so they had to spend all the resources on that dome right there. Next up is his buddy, James Knox Taylor, who was the supervising architect of the United States Department of the Treasury from 1897 to 1912. So what this means is that he didn't necessarily design every single building that he is given credit. His name is listed ex officio as supervising architect of hundreds of federal buildings built throughout the United States. One of the things that led to a lot of him getting these um, buildings and, and credit is an act called the Tarsney Act. So we're going to talk about the Tarsney Act after I show you a few of James Knox Taylor's buildings, but they're pretty fantastic. So he did the Ellis Island Immigrant Hospital on Ellis Island, uh, which is on the left part of the island. And it's interesting that this island is where many immigrants came right after the reset. So this is like their landing point, the first time that they stepped foot on ground. And it's an artificial island at that. He also did the Philadelphia Mint, which I showed in a previous video, Fueling the Ancient Grid. Uh, the U.S. Post Office and Courthouse in San Francisco, built just in time for the earthquake. 
the old post office and museum of ceramics in east liverpool ohio 1908 to 1909 and in webster city iowa he also did their post office in 1909 when they had a population of a couple thousand you know he traveled all the way out there i guess or maybe not maybe one of his his architects did and also in mineral wells texas they needed they said, let me get one of those nice post offices that y'all be doing. So that's that. Now, what allowed him to get so many of these buildings was the Tarsney Act, uh, named after John Charles Tarsney, who was a politician from Missouri. So the Tarsney Act permitted private architects to design federal buildings after being selected in a competition under the supervision of the supervising architect of the United States Treasury. Competitions were held for the Alexander Hamilton Customs House, Ellis Island, James Farley Post Office, Cleveland Federal Building, U.S. Post Office and Courthouse in Baltimore, Maryland, and U.S. Custom House in San Francisco, among others. The competitions were met with enthusiasm by the architect community, but were also marred by scandal as when supervisory architect James Knox Taylor picked Cass Gilbert for the New York customs job as Taylor and Gilbert had both been members of the Gilbert and Taylor architecture firm in St. Paul, Minnesota. In 1913, the act was repealed. So they got themselves caught up, but before all that happened, these are some of the buildings that were said to have been erected from this act. Um, pretty magnificent buildings. They all have historical significance, political significance, social significance, and they have definitely changed the landscape. Now, were these buildings built when we were told, or were they brought back to life when we were told? I'm not so sure. So let's look at some of these buildings that these architects designed, and we're gonna just make them a little bit bigger. Starting with Julian Abel and going to buildings designed under the Tarsney Act. Thank you. 
All right, well that does it for this week's video. This will be part one. I'll do at least part two and show more architects and buildings. But thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Take care, stay blessed.